Um, okay, hi everyone, and welcome officially to the fourth session of the International Deep Screening Journal Club. This time round, hosted by the Network of European Researchers in Deep Describing, or NERDS, as we prefer to be known. Uh, my name is Sean Scott. I'm a UK-based researcher and a member of the NERD Steering Committee. Um, my colleague, Kinder Ibrahim, also from the UK, has co-organised today's session, but is uh, unfortunately unwell, so is not joining us. Um, this International Deep Scribing Journal Club is the product of a collaboration between several networks. Uh, so the Australian Deep Scribing Network, the US Deep Scribing Network, the Network of, of European Researchers in Deep Scribing, the European Society of Clinical Pharmacy and the Canadian Medication Appropriateness and Deep Describing Network. Uh, and so to start with, thank you so much to uh, all of the networks for making this happen. Um, and just as a reminder, um, the reason that, that these journal clubs started together is as a group of researchers and clinicians from from different countries and different continents, um, we thought we needed ways to connect and discuss ideas around deep describing recent publications and also complex clinical cases. And so this is our forum. This is how the, the journal club was born. And our goal is to foster connections and collaborations as well as sharing the latest uh, research about deep describing. And I am really excited to introduce our two speakers for this afternoon, uh, if you're in the UK or Europe. Um, uh, Dr. Achim Mortsefisa is a family doctor um, and he is Chair of General Practice and Patient Centeredness in uh, Primary Care. Um, and, and Achim will uh, present on family conferences to facilitate deep prescribing in older outpatients with frailty and polypharmacy or the cough rail cluster randomised trial uh, during the first part of the session. And then we are joined by Dr. Christy Weir, who is a research affiliate at the Sydney School of Public Health, University of Sydney, um, and also a postdoctoral research scholar at the University of Bern in Switzerland. And Christy uh, will be presenting on deep prescribing inappropriate proton pump inhibitors, developing an intervention and planning a trial during the second half of the session. And I think the reason I'm particularly in, uh, excited about both speakers today is we've got both ends of the deep prescribing uh, intervention trial continue and we've got Achim talking about a trial that, is, that has happened and we've got Christy talking about developing an intervention and planning a trial so we get to see the, the full breadth uh, of the kind of research that we can do in deep prescribing. Um, just to remind you of, uh, of the timelines for this afternoon, so uh, Achim will, will present first and then Christy will go straight to her presentation uh, and then we'll do a joint question and answer session at the end. Um, feel free to put questions in the chat throughout. Please keep your microphone muted uh, throughout the talks because um, we've enabled it uh, that you would be permitted to turn your microphone on so that we can go straight into the Q&A at the end, but we ask you to refrain from doing that during the, to the talks as not to disturb um, our presenters. Uh, we'll then go into a Q&A session. So I will we will curate any questions that you put in the chat throughout the talks, but also there'll be an opportunity to ask more questions during that 20 minute session. Uh, and we'll then do a wrap up uh, where we will also include um, a short satisfaction survey uh, so that you can let us know how you think we did in terms of organizing. Just a little bit of housekeeping. Um, we are going to um, be recording today's session. So again, if you can just remember to keep your microphone, microphones off uh, during the uh, presentations. Uh, not everyone is able to attend live. And so that's why we'd like to record these. People are in different time zones, et cetera. Uh, and the recordings will be made available on the CADEN uh, website and the YouTube channel later today. Uh, more information about the recording uh, will be on the CADEN uh, Deep Describing uh, uh, website. Okay, uh, and also I've been asked to note that the previous uh, Journal Club uh, presentations are also on the CADEN website as well. Okay, so without further ado, I would like to uh, hand over to our first speaker, Achim. Achim, over to you. Okay. So hello to everybody. Um, thank you very much for the opportunity to present you some results of our co study. Uh, do you see the screen, uh, everybody? Okay, thank yes, you. Yes, 
Um, Okay, first to introduce myself. Uh, this is our team um, in at the university. I have two jobs. Um, one is the uh, I'm a practicing general practitioner in Cologne since 20 years, and with the other job, I'm working at the Witten Herdecke University in the uh, Institute of General Practice and Primary Care. And um, one moment. So, yeah, okay. So, and um, this is um, in, uh, uh, located in the western part of Germany near of Dortmund. It's a small university with two faculties of health, one of health and one of economy, a private with public. Um, 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 it, 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 it's also public. Okay, so um, what is the background of our study? Um, so we're talking about geriatric frailty defined as an age-related syndrome of physiological decline characterized by marked vulnerability to adverse health outcomes. This definition is of Freed and um, we applied for our study population, the CSHA clinical frailty scale developed by Rockwood. Uh, it is in a sort of general, um, general estimation of, of frailty by, by the doctors. And um, so in our um, study, we included this, these groups of patients excluded were patients in palliative care with a life ex expectancy below six months. So the other point is polypharmacy. So uh, defined by an intake of five or more drugs per day. And uh, as you know, polypharmacy can trigger or increase frailty, but so it is so from that, it is also a promising intervention to improve safety of geriatric patients. So, and some studies in the last years tried to investigate this, this function. So deep prescribing um, is a planned and supervised process of dose reduction or stopping of medication that might be causing harm or no longer be to, of benefit. And so what we um, know from our workshops with, with uh, general practitioners is that good communication is a key factor uh, for the process of deprescribing, not all, only. So some, some other studies, um, they planned interventions, technical electronic decision support or advice by pharmacists is also very interesting, but we felt that we should try another way. And we know from the, um, from our workshops, we saw that um, the discussion always revolves around uh, these three issues. So the one is how are you feeling at the moment with this drug, the actual tolerance, then apart from that, what is the general ri risk of this medication that you take, like um, pot potentially inappropriate medicines, um, so would cause might be cause harm in the future, and the third aspect is um, what are the individual therapeutic goal that we intend with this drug? So, and we have to, so we, we felt it would be good to, to, um, oh, there's some noise. Okay, thank you. Um, so it would be a good idea to, to um, address these three topics in a structured communication. Um, our research, research question was, 
uh, to investigate the effects of family conferences on joint prioritization and deprescribing for frail outpatients with polypharmacy. And the family conferences, is this a feature that has been introduced in palliative care or intensive care uh, units uh, with, with uh, uh, good, um, good experiences? Okay. Um, so the methods we designed a um, classic cluster randomized controlled trial uh, with the intervention and the control group care as usual. Uh, the assessments were uh, carried out by uh, by um, um, by study nurses and uh, a few information were were obtained by from from GPs. So um, um, follow up after six and twelve months. The primary outcome was a mean number of hospitalizations after twelve months, and we had some other secondary outcomes: a mean number of drugs, potential appropriate medications. Also, we performed also a geriatric assessment and a health economic evaluation. So the first problem was the pandemic because we had to switch to telephone interviews um, with the study nurses. So um, at first we, we, uh, we started with, with um, home visits. So the intervention was um, was based by a training concept for GPs. Um, in the center was is it was a, a guideline how to uh, conduct a, a structured family conference. This is the guideline, and um, the preparation is is very important. And uh, we we saw that this. The medical message on the prescribe, we call it like you have to make a, a, a proper statement what is important, why we talk together on medication today. Because if you do not that, then then the patient asks, oh, what, what are you talking about? So and then you, you do the, the medication check. So we, we, we pre-tested and piloted it. So that was the best way to, to, to conduct this family conference. And um, we always uh, had um, relatives or others, other nursing staff uh, with, with us in these conferences. Um, so we have other elements in the, um, in the uh, intervention, uh, consideration of non-pharmacological needs in the geriatric checklist. And um, we have a um, deprescribing manual uh, was uh, developed by the colleagues of the clinical pharmacology, Ms. Thürmann, Petra Thürmann. And um, so that's the overview of the intervention. This is um, just a view into the deprescribing manual with the chapters, 11 chapters on the most important medication categories and uh, there are, we had we have um, added also some practical advice how to manage the the deprescribing process so this let's proceed to the results of the study the study population was around 600 patients we had a, a dropout problem uh, before baseline uh, assessment, also due to the pandemic. So altogether, um, around about 520 patients were, could be included in the, um, in the uh, um, sorry, oops, uh, could be included in the, um, um, intention to treat um, population. So um, 
this is one problem of the study. So we have some practical things to discuss. And um, so the baseline characteristics between the both groups uh, did not differ um, in general. So just um, typical um, uh, geriatric population with a mean age of 38, uh, 33, sorry. And um, more than nine medication per day. Um, so the primary outcome, we did not see any uh, difference after 12 months in the number of hospitalizations. Um, so this is, yeah, maybe it was a little bit over optimistic to, to, to choose this endpoint. So we have we, this outcome we, can, we could discuss if you want. And then the, the secondary outcomes, the number of medication after six months, we saw a decrease um, in the intervention group um, by, yeah, 0.8 medication per patient. Uh, so this is a um, success. So this is okay for me. So we saw an effect on this level. But after 12 months, we uh, we also saw that the the um, this effect was not not longer uh, significant. Um, so the the, the same uh, effects uh, in the number of potentially inappropriate medications. Mm, also after six months. Uh, uh, in, in significant effect, but after 12 months, it was not longer significant. Okay. Um, so the functional status of the patients assessment was not um, different between intervention and control. And uh, so if you would like to get more insight into the results and the methods of the study. We have some publications we can, we can share with, uh, with you. Uh, this is the main publication. We have an, um, a paper on the development and, uh, of the intervention with some material uh, some uh, and links uh, if you are interested on the family conferences. And um, the describing manual, you can read something about that in, in, other, in another publication. So what are the conclusions? Uh, we, had, we saw no influence on hospitalizations, um, but um, basically we saw the, the um, decreased number of medications in the intervention group after six months. So we can conclude that family conferences for shared decision-making can su successfully initiate the process of deprescribing. And um, so my point of discussion or the, my question to you is, um, would you generally recommend a non-inferiority approach to the prescribing studies. Thank you very much. Thank you, Achim. That was a super interesting presentation. It's good to see another deprescribing RCT under the belt. Um, and I really like the uh, the question that you posed to the audience, um, which we will ask them to respond to um, in about 15 to 20 minutes time. Um, until then, I would now like to hand over to Christy. Um, Christy, whenever you're ready. Okay. Hopefully everyone can see that all right. Yeah, great. Looks good, Christy, yeah. Excellent. Um, so today I'll be talking about deprescribing potentially inappropriate proton pump inhibitors or PPIs, developing an intervention and planning a trial. So I'm a postdoctoral research fellow 
um, at the University of Sydney in Australia. However, I'm based at the Institute of Primary Healthcare, BHAM, at the University of Bern in Switzerland. So just in case you were wondering if you should visit Switzerland, the answer is a resounding yes. And on the bottom left is a river called the Arte, which um, goes through Bern. And so some people do use the river to travel to work. I'm too afraid with my laptop. And here is just a, a quick slide of all the fun things that we do as a team. And you can um, look at this a bit later. So with this talk today, I'll give a brief introduction and then I'll talk um, a little bit about the previous work that um, researchers in this area, researchers in this team have done in this area. And then I'll go into more detail about the drop it trial, which is deprescribing inappropriate PPIs and the intervention development. Um, so just briefly, this is the team at the University of Bern, the Institute of Primary Healthcare on the far left. And you can try and pick the black and white photos with the colorful ones when they're having more fun. Um, and on the right here, we have um, Professor Jennifer Inouye, who is um, in the Institute of Psychology and uh, a specialist in gastroenterology, Pascal on the right, who are not at BHAM, but who are involved in the team. And this is just to give you another brief overview of um, the core team on the left, the advisory group on the right, a lot of expertise from a lot of different countries. And we're also in the process of um, building a stakeholder group with pharmacists, patients, and GPs. So why PPIs? So PPIs are prescribed for treating gastric acid-related diseases, and their use is increasing in Switzerland and elsewhere. Long-term PPI use is also um, has been targeted by Switzerland's smarter medicine movement as an unnecessary treatment. And often PPIs, PPIs may be started, um, perhaps in hospitals, and uh, over time, the indication for using them becomes less and less. And there are potential harms with PPIs, including um, vitamin B12 and iron deficiency, fractures, infections, and dementia, um, which uh, lends to the proposal of deprescribing uh, when there's no indication for PPIs. So some previous work um, on this topic is a quantitative study, um, which is under review, and it's work done by Renata. I think there's a photo there at the corner. Um, the aim was to identify potentially inappropriate PPI prescribing, which was defined as too high of a dose or no indication, and to see how GPs manage PPIs over uh, a one-year period. And this was done in a consecutive sample of GPs, or 11, it was conducted in Swiss primary care setting in a quality circle. So 206 patients, 15%, uh, were identified as having a PPI for longer than um, eight or more weeks. And 41% of those were potentially inappropriate. So here we can see what happened one year later with those potentially inappropriate PPIs, where they reduced or stopped. And I would like to, um, perhaps I didn't make it clear from my previous slide, so the GPs themselves identified if they were potentially inappropriate. So GPs looking at their own um, patients, their own medical records. Uh, and so after doing that, deprescribing was successful in 35% of patients. So after one year, only 35% were reduced or stopped. So why was that? Um, so some of the um, main reasons that GPs mentioned was that there was a lack of discussion uh, with the patients. There was a presence of symptoms that the PPI was needed. Um, the PPI indication changed to appropriate or the patient was unwilling to deprescribe their PPI. So other previous work that was also done by this team by um, three pharmacy students were qualitative interviews with GPs and patients. So GPs were asked about um, deprescribing PPIs, the barriers and enablers to this. And they talked about um, having trouble determining if a PPI is really necessary, if it's appropriate or inappropriate. They also talked about um, PPI deprescribing not being so much of a priority with that much else to do. 
and also the effort on how to uh, address or motivate or convince patients to reduce or stop their PPIs. We also um, interviewed patients who were taking potentially inappropriate PPIs, and they talked about having a lack of knowledge about why they take their PPIs. They also mentioned um, how important it was to have maintain a quality of life and not to have reflux symptoms. And they also mentioned a fear of symptoms returning after deprescribing, and um, they wanted more support to, to actually reduce or stop their PPIs um, by way of communication, a plan, or alternative. So this brings us to the rationale for the study and also the intervention development. So we can see that awareness, um, particularly for GPs, isn't enough and that support is needed to successfully deprescribe PPIs. Uh, so for GPs, it could be a definition of suitable and unsuitable PPIs. And for the discussion, addressing more the rebound symptoms or um, other measures to use. And for patients, more information about PPI use, the reasons for it and alternatives. So now I'll talk more about the, the drop it trial to stop or reduce potentially inappropriate PPIs. So this trial has officially started and it goes from 2023 to 2027. And the chief investigator is Professor Sven Streit, who has received funding from the Swiss National Science Foundation to conduct this trial. The aim is to investigate the effectiveness of an intervention for patients and GPs to deprescribe inappropriate PPIs in adults in the German speaking part of Switzerland. It's a randomized controlled trial with 80 GPs and, and approximately five patients each with um, the target of 400 um, patients to be recruit, recruited. The randomization will be at the individual GP level and the intervention will involve counseling material and I'll go into that in more detail. The control group um, receives usual care and the duration is for one year and um, follow-up of patients will be uh, over the phone every three months. And the co-primary outcomes are, is a, um, a change or reduction in PPI dose, and also looking at reflux symptoms and 12 months follow-up. Uh, so this is just to give you an overview of the, um, of the trial itself, the co-primary and secondary outcomes, and also um, to mention that although we have a target of recruiting 80 GPs, we have so far recruited 42. And, um, and also to mention that as part of the trial, we will be conducting a process evaluation of the intervention and the cost effectiveness evaluation as well. However, um, where we're up to currently is that we're preparing an ethics submission, finalizing the protocol and so forth, and we're also developing, so in the, in the stages of developing the intervention. Which is why it would be great um, uh, for you all to consider and for us to get your guidance and advice on, on several points. And so I'll mention them now so you can have them in your mind. Um, so we're currently having a discussion around um, defining and measuring the prescribing, and we would love to capture, you know, stop, reduce, or also a switch to on-demand use, particularly for more PPIs. So, um, but when we say stop, what do we mean by that? Is that stop on any given day, or is it a sustained stop over a period of time? Um, do we look at the prescription data, which will have this information from GPs, and we will have and quite detailed medical information from GPs versus use um, where we would obtain this information from the patients. So with a reduction in PPI use, we'll be looking at the cumulative dose over one year. Um, and we will be able to see if that will be see how we'll be able to see if that fluctuates, including a reduction, an increase, or restarting. Um, and we also would like to capture um, a switch to on-demand use because that would be, I think for us, would be considered a positive thing and um, information from patients is crucial for this. And if I didn't mention it before, I'd just like to say that with the co-primary outcome of the reflux disease questionnaire, this is a non-inferiority um, outcome. So I don't think I should mention that. Another consideration we would love to get your, your insights on uh, is around blinding. So um, Sven has been recruiting 
GPs, um, some of which through quality circles in the German speaking part of Switzerland. And he uh, founded, he talked about the conundrum of uh, presenting the research question, the topic to GPs to have them uh, participate in the study, to agree to being involved, and also balancing that against how much information do you give people about what the study is about. And particularly with um, primary care, with GPs, it's becoming, it's, at least we've noticed it here in Switzerland, it's becoming increasingly difficult to recruit GPs into studies. And um, it, we found it would be impossible to recruit any if we had a very, very high level description of what the study is about. So um, we'd love to hear from the audience how you've managed the aspect of blinding, um, with recruiting uh, particularly clinicians into the study. So now I'll just briefly talk about the intervention components that we have so far. So uh, particularly Martina has led this work in developing a flowchart for GPs to screen patients with the inclusion and exclusion criteria. And this has been um, trialed. Uh, Stan and Pascal have both filed this with their um, in their own practice to see how that is going. Um, and we have also translated the deprescribing algorithm um, by um, Professor Barbara Farrell and colleagues. This is where the this has led, and um, we're in the process of of. Um, doing a think aloud study with with GPs to to look at how to use both of these tools. And um, and another aspect of the intervention is the use of behavior change theory um, and the deep prescribing intervention. So uh, we plan to use behavior change theory to design the intervention and also for the implementation. And this is so that we can identify feasible implementation strategies that are context specific, but also to understand the theoretical mechanisms of change and also the intervention functions. So, um, you know, we, we all know what it's like to develop a, an intervention and trial it and perhaps not really know why it has or hasn't worked. So this is why we um, really focus on this aspect um, thoroughly. And um, we have created a matrix of barriers and enablers of deep prescribing PPIs for GPs and patients. And just to talk you through that um, a little bit further, so for every barrier and enabler for GPs and patients, um, we then look towards the theoretical domains framework to identify the behavior determinants um, using the behavior change wheel for the intervention functions and then the behavior change techniques for um, looking towards changing the behavioral determinant and then identifying the implementation and mode of delivery these behavior change techniques. So perhaps you're thinking you're going to have 100 behavior change techniques after this activity. You're right. Um, however, the next steps will be to uh, a process of selecting the behavior change techniques and then to um, conduct a, a think aloud study and some form of pilot study with patients and GPs with the specific intervention component. However, another point for consideration is to, um, you know, how to how to uh, bring together the theoretical knowledge, um, and also with the the deep prescribing PPI literature, the, the behavior change techniques that we've identified. How do we combine this together? And you know, we are looking towards having a selection process, perhaps with the stakeholder group and the advisory group that I had in my slide to begin with. However, we also have data already, which is very relevant um, to this work. The qualitative study with, with, um, with adults taking potentially inappropriate PPIs and also GPs I touched upon earlier. And also a health symposium. We have um, uh, observations and notes from this, these roundtable discussions with pharmacists and GPs who um, were brainstorming strategies for deep prescribing. And we also have other data which is relevant to PPI uses. So just to bring it back to the questions for everybody, and you can ask me questions too, but um, just to, to remind everybody about, uh, you know, the really the, uh, the mutual 
uh, learning from these journal clubs, which I think is is great. Um, and these were the two that I that I brought forward before, and also the selection of behavior change techniques and how to use previous data for for this step. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christy. And um, thank you for those beautiful images of Switzerland. I think our first question is probably, have you got any jobs going? <laughs> we can, oh, so we can come and join you. <laughs> yes, um, no, I'm I'm a pro at working out ways to get, you know, international people to Switzerland and stay. <laughs> that sounds really good. Um, okay, everyone. So we'll now move over to our Q&A session. And um, I think rather helpfully, both our speakers also have some questions for, for, for us in the audience as well. So, yeah, I'll open it up to the floor. Does anyone have any questions for Achim and or Christy? We've got um, Ian Maidman. I can see your hand up. Go for it. Hi. Great presentations. Thank you both. Um, I'm going to be quite challenging to you both, OK? So I will ask you why we need RCTs, but I think we need to use RCTs very intelligently for this. So typically for deprescribing trials, they're negative. Um, if you're looking to bring a drug to market, that's 500 million pounds. An RCT for a deprescribing study is maybe 2 million. And you look at the dichotomy there, okay? It's always gonna be really difficult, okay? I think you both alluded to it. Recruitment's always challenging, okay? You work really hard. I also think that even if your RCT shows an effect, you've then got to implement it into the real world. So if you were doing an RCT in England for a deep prescribing intervention, you probably do it in London, Oxford or Cambridge. Have best clinicians, lots of support. You have then got to take it out into the real world, the back of beyond, and it's still got to work there, okay? So I think RCTs are important, but I think we really need to look well beyond RCTs. I think the process evaluation that Kirsty is going to do will be valuable, OK, because that would tell us why um, it does or doesn't work. I think we, we do need to look beyond RCTs because I think RCTs are always going to be really challenging for complex intervention because it's hard to standardise, but you need to standardise it um, and the implementation is going to be really difficult. So I'm sorry, I've been a bit negative there, but that's my opinion. I think we, we do really need to look beyond the RCT model to get effective interventions in the real world. Because this is talked a lot about in academia, um, but in the real world, it's not really taken off at all. Responses. Him and Christy, did you, yeah, did you, Achim? <laughs> Yes, thank you very much. Uh, so uh, when I presented this study, the European Network of General Practitioner Research um, in Antwerp last, last year, so a colleague of you from England uh, said, uh, so what are we doing? Uh, we blame our best ideas with such um, RCTs, they have no chance for, for success. So that is, so to be honest, the problem was when we planned the study, we, and, 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 and tried to get funding for it. Everyone told us you need a clinical endpoint, um, a patient relevant outcome. Okay, so we choose hospitalizations. So I wouldn't choose this. So next time I will use another outcome because the first is it is a uh, cumulative endpoint because so the effects of intervention when they it's processing uh, it will be not very strong over the time. So on the other the other thing thing is that the um, non inferior. Um, um, approach is also have some problems and the third is um, that uh, you have not um, so the 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 effects influencing so you 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 train the the GP then they should do something with the patient and the patient and that so you have a very long how to call it so um, causal uh, path you know 
So this is this is very difficult. So um, yeah, you can can uh, make a suggestion how we 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 do better studies, uh, especially to get um, yeah to bring it uh, into into the into the whole countries and uh, you know so. I mean, I agree. It's an issue with the funders. I, I agree. The funders they want um, these RCT type things for hard endpoints, and like in the UK, NICE tend to focus on RCTs. Um, I, I, so there is a wider issue there. Um, but I think it's it's um, it, these are hard studies to do. Having done them, they're not easy. Um, I'm sure both of you would agree with, with that. They're challenging to recruit. Um, and I think you you even if they work, you've then got to take what you've done and put it in the real world. But I think you're right. It's the funders who have big issues. So thank you. Christy, did, did you have anything you wanted to come in on? Um, you know, I, I agree with the, the points that have been made. Um, I think that from our perspective, we have been trying to stay as close as possible to clinical practice and trying to um, be pragmatic with the decisions that we're making and, and the endpoints that we're trying to capture. And then also by bringing in the behavior change element, implementation strategies and so forth. I think our main priority is to learn from what others have done in this space. And of course, not to, you know, assuming that we'll never come across any difficulties, but really not to reinvent the wheel, but to learn from the, um, the wisdom of others. But, you know, it's still an RCT. We will also have, um, uh, you know, behavioral endpoints as well. So to also, we'll have clinical endpoints too, but also looking at, um, other endpoints as well. What, what are your behavioural endpoints? I shouldn't have said that. Um, <laughs> so we, are <laughs> we are still finalising those. Okay. If you have some suggestions, Ian, I'd love to hear them. <laughs> trust. trust. Yeah, within. trust, yeah. Trust would be an interesting one. Um, I mean, it's, it's hard to measure though because you're, you, you've either got to measure them qualitatively or quantitatively um trust um i guess the uh, shared decision making would be an interesting one to look at mm -hmm. um person centered care the level of that um again these 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 are hard things to quantify um it is you've got this tension between you want these soft qualitative measures which you're trying to quantify um they're difficult really i, th I think at the top of my head they would be the ones that i would look at yeah, I, I agree that you have got a lot of qualitative data there, which I think is really good. You've got a, a big process evaluation, which I think is really important. Um, and I think, this is, I think it's an important area you're both looking at. Um, I think this is a hard area, that's what is, I'm sure you both know. Um, so yeah, the good, great presentation, so thank you both. Thanks Ian for starting us off. And, um, Jennifer has put in the chat um, to, to consider looking at hybrid trials as well that measure effectiveness um, aspects of implementation. So I guess those could be other outcomes that you could be looking at. Um, so you've got the behavioral ones and then and then related, but, but different are the implementation ones. Um, Bob, you've put something in the chat that I'm happy to read out, but I wondered if you just wanted to, to, to turn your mic on and, and perhaps um, yeah, let us know what you're thinking. Sure, sure. Um, both, first of all, thank you to both presenters. Um, presentations are really interesting. I think like at trying to do this in my practice two days a week with older patients, the I'm not missing information that deprescribing works. I know that it helps patients. I know in some cases we can't always stop the medication because symptoms recur, but we, we try anyway. But I think one of the things that I see missing for clinicians is the information about knowing what to expect when they reduce or stop a drug. So we have very little information for anticholinergic medications, for example. We don't know exactly what the withdrawal symptoms are. We don't know how quickly they happen. We don't know when they peak. We don't know how severe they are. We don't know how long they last. And that is one of the things that causes inertia 
for people when trying to stop a medication is they don't know what's going to happen. So I, I just wanted to put that out there because I don't know if anybody is really looking at that for different classes of medications, because that's the information we need in order to develop guidelines that would help people make decisions. Thank you, Bob. Um, I, I was just wondering, Achim, yeah, did, did you have any data from your trial regarding withdrawal events that you were able to share? Or just off the, yeah, off the top of your head? Um, so could you, uh, could you repeat the question, the last one? Yeah, sorry. So Bob was saying about kind of um, that, in, that in trials, what would be good is we've, so we've got data that shows that deprescribing is safe and we've got um, some data that says that it, that it may also lead to positive outcomes. But obviously, particularly for something like non-inferiority, what, what we also really want is data on, on adverse drug withdrawal events. And I was just wondering, given that you did some deep describing in your trial, did, did, did you look at those and, and yes. yeah, have you got anything to share? Yeah. So the analysis is still ongoing. On, uh, on, so we, what we uh, saw is that um, the drugs the mo so that has been um, withdrawn, so was PPIs, statins, um, allopurinol, so uh, urate lowering drugs, and um, so not so uh, the anticholinergic drugs, those are the psychopharma. Uh, so this is a special issue. I would agree with you, Barbara. And so we're doing uh, at the moment. We do another uh, project on uh, with focus on um, uh, anticholinergic drugs and sedatives, and we uh, we there we develop a guideline with tapering schemes such as how to reduce hyperbolic reduce uh, hyperbole reduce of uh, of these drugs and what how to monitor it and what the alternatives are so this is a very special field so our focus was more um cardiovascular drugs and the, the common so internal medicine drugs uh, in in general practice so the psychopharmaca uh, uh, this is this is a special problem you know I, I would agree yeah thank you okay next um I've got uh, Jennifer you've got your hand up did you want to ask a question yes hi good morning from cold almost snowing in Canada right now in Alberta <laughs> um, went from 30 degrees to literally snowfall warnings um anyway good morning um my question is for is regarding somebody mentioned about the fact that deprescribing trials rarely have very robust um, positive results or the results. And I wonder if it's related mostly to what the primary, what has been listed as the primary outcome and whether or not that that primary outcome is actually the most important outcome to measure. And I, I wondered if people are doing work on really asking patients what do, what is primary outcome for them? Is it reducing just pill burden reduction in itself is huge, especially among the long-term care or the uh, nursing home population. So satisfaction for patients in taking less drugs, just the physical act of taking the drugs, and satisfaction for healthcare providers having to deliver all of those drugs as well. And that's notwithstanding the effects on the body as far as reduced hospitalizations and reduced adverse um, events. It's really hard to power study to find those things. So are, has there been work looking more at what patients want and say a their primary outcome would be? Thank you. Thanks, Jennifer. Achim and Christy, have you got any, any thoughts? So for our study, we um, we had a participative um, development with stakeholder uh, by, by uh, involving the GPs in the intervention development and some patient some patients, but this was not so 
like that what you meant. Uh, I think we need more um, research that involves uh, patients from the beginning and we need more patient relevant, not not only clinical, but relevant means they choose the endpoints, the outcomes in our research. On the other hand, my question would be, so what outcomes could would you think could one imagine uh, for 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 the prescribing of just like statins or or antihypertensive anti drugs? What would you think? What dimensions could they have these these outcomes relevant for patients from their point of view? Um, well, I I know it's extremely difficult to power for a study looking at rare events such as adverse adverse um, events in a hospitalized population during discharge. So I'm thinking of things like asking patients and and caregivers and loved ones, what does it mean for you to have this be prescribed? Is it going to be even satisfaction? Reduced pill burden in, in itself is a, a measure. Yeah. Um, and because we know why it's important, um, falls, th things that are maybe more common and maybe they didn't end up back in hospital because I, I think it, in your trial, the, the population was relatively young, um, 60, 60, 70 years old. It's a fairly young population, at least from where I live in Canada. We are seeing mostly 80 plus year olds going to hospital for those types of things. So I just wondered if lack of hospital admission for stopping a PPI, you'd need a lot of hospital admissions to measure that, to find those patients who need hospital admission, at least for where I live in Canada, I think it would be getting a sample size that large to detect change would be really difficult. And maybe Barbara um, or somebody else, other um, people in a similar population could talk with more expertise in there can comment on comment. Thanks, Jennifer. Yeah, and I think probably the other thing that you touched on, something that we've struggled with here in the UK on a trial is finding an outcome that is also acceptable to the funder and ultimately to our government, because often what they want us to measure is not what we want to measure and also not probably what, what patients and their carers want to measure. Um, you know, ultimately that comes down to if you can reduce health resource use, that's that's an outcome that that they favor, right? Um, which is which is nice, but yeah. We, we had a big fight um, on for one of our grants on um, uh, for, for our primary outcome, and, and actually, eventually, we had to go for one that we didn't really want to use. Otherwise, we weren't going to get the money. So that's another dynamic as well. Um, yeah. So I think we've got time for one more question um, before we wrap up. If anyone, if anyone wants to go, yes. Rick, is it Rick? Sorry if I have pronounced your name wrong. Reggie, and can you hear me? Yes, we can yeah, hear you. Yeah. Go for it. I, I'm from Denmark, uh, the Danish College of Pharmacy Practice, uh, where I work with research with the community pharmacies. And thank you both for uh, for inspiring uh, presentation and, and great work. Um, I was um, curious about the, the intervention and the shared decision-making process and the dialogue and the communication with the patients. Do you plan to... Um, uh, Akim, do have you already data on it, or, or Christy, do you plan to also um, um, describe or gather data on what do you talk with the patients about? Because we know a lot of the barriers they have. You mentioned some of those also, um, but we are struggling with um, uh, what is the right way to talk to them and address the barriers. So I was curious about your thoughts about that. Yeah, I think that is, um, you know, one of the most important questions. Um, a study that I've been working on recently, an online experimental study, used a hypothetical scenario to present a deprescribing recommendation. And 80% uh, of participants agreed with the deprescribing recommendation in four countries. However, 20% disagreed. 
And so we've uh, conducted a content analysis about why they disagreed and um, what types of information or communication did these, pe did these people want in order to feel, you know, have their doubts alleviated or uh, to feel more supported in order to achieve it. So I think it's, it's incredibly important to not only, you know, develop the intervention with enough support in terms of communication for patients so that uh, GPs are able to, to feel confident in order to um, discuss PPI, deprescribing and the process around it, but also find a way to measure or at least to capture to some extent the communication that occurs during that process, particularly if it happens not only over one consultation, but over many. And, uh, you know, I think it's, it's also quite tricky because GPs are individuals in and of themselves, but also patients are as well, and their communication needs are going to differ and their levels of um, you know, how comfortable they are with uncertainty and how much time, how much support they'll need to, um, you know, to be able to achieve that tapering or deprescribing is really going to be an individual process, which is, I think, even more why it's important to capture. So, uh, you know, we are looking at ways to make sure we can, we can do that. We're talking to patients every three months and uh, looking at patients after they have that consultation with the GP. But I'd also be interested to see, Achim, how, uh, how you captured that shared decision-making consultation, particularly if it is something that happened over multiple consultations and, you know, without having a video or a recording device in, in the room, you know, it can be difficult to, uh, to look at. Thanks, Christy. Um, Achim, I'll, yeah. I'll, I, could offer you, I could offer you 60 seconds for okay. a response, and then so, we need to close. Thank you. <laughs> Our process evaluation is still ongoing. We have the protocols of, the, uh, of every family conference that uh, happened. So we actually we, we try to find out what happened there. So, uh, and we have, apart from this, interviews, qualitative interviews, process evaluative interviews with uh, GPs and patients. So um, we know that p the the um, patients are more open for the prescribing than the doctors thought. Now, this is one first result. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, thanks once more, Achim and Christy, for two um, absolutely fantastic um, presentations. Uh, and as I said earlier, the um, the recordings uh, will be available online uh, pending uh, approval from, from our speakers. Um, I just, if you can all hang on just for a couple of minutes, I've just got a couple of things that I would like to um, talk to you about before you go on with your day. Uh, the first thing is I want to uh, let you know um, about our next uh, Deep Prescribing Journal Club, this time hosted by the US Deep Prescribing Network. Uh, the session will be on Wednesday, the 20th of September at 11 until 12 uh, uh, p.m. Uh, Eastern Time, uh, presented by Dr. Ariel Green from John Hopkins University. And I believe someone is going to be putting the link so that you can sign up to that right now in the chat. Uh, as well. So please do uh, sign up um, and come along to that one if you're available. If not, it will be available online as well. Um, and before you leave, uh, we would really value your feedback on how we have organised the session, how we've pitched this. So we would be uh, really grateful if you could respond to the poll that will be popping up for you now, uh, just to let us know. There's just three questions. And if you could just very quickly answer that for us, that would be really, really valuable. If you have any other feedback, um, or actually you're interested in getting involved in planning the journal clubs, or, or even speaking at one of the journal clubs, um, or, or you've got a topic to suggest, then please also let us know at info at cardon.recad.ca. Um, again, there's more information on the Canadian Deep Describing and Medication Appropriateness Network um, if you, uh, if you uh, want to go back to that later. Uh, so while you're doing that, I will just finish by saying uh, thank you very much to everyone who has attended today. Thanks again to our speakers. And of course, thanks to the organising committee uh, across the various networks. Uh, wish you um, all the best and see you next time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Goodbye. Thanks very much. Thanks. Bye.